The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, Where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test him, because he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred days' wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? Jesus said, Have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place, so the men reclined, about five thousand in number. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, Gather the fragments left over, so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled twelve wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had, that had been more than they could eat. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Since Jesus knew that they were going to come and carry him off to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. The Gospel of the Lord. We Christians are a sadly divided people, and it shouldn't be so. The history of Protestantism, especially, is the story of dispute, disagreement, and division. For example, here in the United States, there are some 250 different denominations or fellowships of Baptists. We Christians are Catholic and Protestant, Orthodox, pre- and post-millennial, Armenians and Calvinists, traditional and contemporary, conservative and liberal. It's okay to have differences. That's part of what it means to be human. It's the way God made us. Husbands and wives have differences but they work hard at building on common ground, talking through differences and maintaining a marriage, a unity in the face of all sorts of situations and obstacles. Differences aren't the problem. It's how we handle the differences. This week's second reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians is an appeal to the church to be united, to be unified, to be whole. Listen to what Paul says. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Paul begins with a strong appeal. He uses the Greek word parakaleo, translated in very different ways, but here it means urge, beseech, to beg. He tries to urge us strongly. He appeals to us. He exhorts us. And he encourages us. He begs not just as an apostle, but as a prisoner for the Lord. He is appealing to the reader's sympathies. Paul appeals to Christians to act with integrity, to live out their faith in everyday practice, to live a life or lead a life of integrity. The Ephesians are to conduct their, themselves in a way that is worthy of their high calling as Christians. Sometimes we use the term calling as a special calling 
for a full-time Christian ministry. But as I pointed out two weeks ago, calling for Christians is not just to ministry. It's not just for the ordained ministry. It is a calling or an invitation by Christ to each and every one of us. Paul continues when he says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with another in love. We need to take a look at those elements that St. Paul just mentioned. Humble or humility. You've seen it. Our congregations and our denominations and our fellowships of like-minded churches develop a pride in our distinctiveness or our tradition or our purity or our being spirit-filled or our unbroken succession from the apostles themselves. The result is that we look down on other Christian groups. Our pride should be in Christ Jesus and in his spirit working freely in our midst and not in the peculiarities of our history or our beliefs. When we glory in Christ Jesus, then rather than in ourselves, then we can say we have true humility. And that humility is required to keep unity in Christ's church. The second element that Paul gives us is gentleness. It's hard for us to understand meekness and gentleness, but the definition, the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance, rings true. You've met them and I've met them, maybe we're even those persons ourselves. People who keep you at arm's length, who protect and project an aloofness, an air of superiority. Their self-image is at stake, and they can't seem to be real. Jesus, on the other hand, lived gentleness. In fact, this very gentleness and openness is what attracted people to him. It was in contrast to what the Pharisees did, their hardness of hearts. Jesus exhibited an openness towards others that freed them. Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This kind of gentleness and openness is essential for unity in Christ's church. Patience. All humans are resistant to change. Change is hard and takes time to get used to. We're in a hurry for others to adopt our point of view or to get their act together. But when it comes to us, well, that takes some time. We must extend to others the same kind of patience that we wish them to extend to us. Patience is one of the core Christian values that is vital for Christian unity. Forbearance. In the United States, we live in an overly tolerant society where we are often willing to tolerate practically any behavior or belief in the name of freedom of expression. But in the church, the pendulum often swings very far in the other direction. We are intolerant of other points of views, of other interpretations, of eccentricities, or of differences. Over the years, I've had the luck and the joy of participating in churches of many widely different points of view. I found that fundamental churches can be intolerant. But even liberal churches, which pride themselves on their tolerance, can be intolerant of those who disagree with them. We are called as Christians to endure, 
to bear with and to put up with one another. We may not be terribly comfortable with others, but our job description is to bear with one another. Look at Jesus. He put up with Peter's impetuousness, with James's and John's pride, and with Thomas's unbelief. Jesus had his eyes on what they could become, not on their immaturities and blind sides. Forbearance and tolerance are necessary for the unity of Christ's church. Love. The Greeks rarely use the word love. They have several different words that describe different kinds of love. But the Christian writers use the one that is pronounced agape. It was selected to describe the particular quality of Christ-like unselfish love that looked out for others' needs rather than for one's own. Love is the last quality in Paul's list of essential attitudes for unity, but it is also the most encompassing. Later on in Paul's letter, we hear these words which have become so very familiar to us because how often they are used at weddings. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Sometimes we find justifications in love for our divisions and separations. But too often we are unwilling to go to the limits, to, ma- to, ma- to, to the limits of love to maintain unity. Sometimes we may find it easier to say that we love the other person, the stranger. But are we willing and able to love the person that is sitting next to us? Are we able and willing to love the person that we live with? And are we willing and able to love ourselves?